Good morning and welcome to Talking Point here on WESN, the content capital. My name is Keaton Shaw. Thank God it's Friday. Yes, it's the weekend once more. And it's the first day of the seven month of the year. Isn't time flying by fast? Friday, the 1st of July, 2022. Well, we're happy that you're with us this morning. And uh, very briefly, let me quickly congratulate all SA students who would have uh, collected their results this morning. Um, uh, celebrating uh, the step to, uh, in uh, the right direction, I suppose we can say, a uh, climbing up of the ladder. Uh, no matter what the results may be, whether or not you believe it to be in your favour, at the end of the day, always remember that the future is in your hands and it is up to you. It's the start of something you make the most of it. So congratulations to all students on successfully writing the essay exam and collecting their results. Alongside me this morning is my co-host and colleague, Mr. Sean Michael Small. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Keaton. Yes, it is not a bad day, actually, to, hey, to collect some results. Dressed in all black, though. Well, I mean, let's not worry about that. You didn't get any memo today. Is I, did, I didn't get It's all Black Friday. I never, I never get any of these memos. Yeah, so we, we, somehow, we're, for some reason, we're celebrating New Zealand rugby team today. I don't know why. Oh, I, the old blacks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a beautiful day to collect SA results um, this Friday. Um, all of the unfortunate weather, most of us managed to avoid that. Um, reports still are uh, coming in with regards to what happened in the northeast of the country. We'll get into that in the second topic because there was a press conference by the um, I guess you could say the disaster response team that was headed by the Minister of Local Government. But there's, there, there's some interesting reports that came um, after that press conference that contradicted or might seem to contradict some of the things that he said. But um, I think for us on Talking Point, one of the big stories really has to be the ongoing situation with the investigation of um, PC Jokes. Yes. And his shooting death. And the fact that um, where we've reached now, it's not necessarily unexpected, um, but to see it officially come down and, you know, to some extent confirm suspicions. But that's what they are still, suspicions. Um, I mean, there are other high-profile cases that did not move as fast. So I, I don't know to what extent if this is a good sign, if this is a bad sign, because some of those cases were still... We're still awaiting more news. Well, first of all, to, uh, a synopsis of the situation. So we are still awaiting the report from the ballistic testing unit. We are yet to receive that. Uh, so the Minister of National Security has not necessarily been very much clear in his commentary over the issue. We were due to get that report a while now, and uh, he keeps delaying it, saying that how oh, it's an ongoing investigation, which is absolutely correct but why is that after how how many weeks or months has it been since the officer passed away you know I, I, it was at his funeral that the uh, acting commissioner of police did to that i'm wearing my mask but i'm smiling this morning yeah so we're, we're talking about three months right two 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 months plus. so so bear that in mind and then the pc yesterday produced a damning report into the shooting death of PC Clarence Gilks, stating that police officers intentionally, deliberately misled the acting commissioner of police. The report states it is the most clear case of abuse of police powers that the PS PCA has ever investigated. It indicates that on the day of the incident, police officers were shooting at a civilian target when PC Gilks was actually mistaken for that. And it stated that officers, of course, deliberately and intentionally misled the Acting Commissioner of Police. It has advised the DPP of action to be taken, and the Acting Commissioner of Police, McDonald Jacob, has already indicated that the law, the law will stand and justice will be served. Well, here is some concerns that I have. Um, one is the fact that it's reported that the Acting Commissioner was misled by task force officers and senior Western Division officers. That implies more than just the three, who, the three other officers who were involved in the shooting. So to what extent now was the potential cover-up um, involved the superiors of those 
that were involved. And, and what the implications of that is that perhaps this is a practice among the TTPS, right? I mean, it, 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 it at least asks the question that then we now have to consider um, because when your subordinates do something so egregiously wrong, we're not talking about, oh, you, you hit uh, a suspect and we don't want to deal with his lawsuit or nonsense, so we'll just kind of cover it up. That's, that's different. You could even argue in something like this, the, the death of a suspect would be different than the death of a fellow police officer to be willing to potentially be involved in some sort of misdirection, cover-up, or interference with that type of case because now it potentially undermines the faith that the other officers might have in the service, in their superiors. But then there's the, the question about the PCA. Okay, the PCA moved right reasonably quickly in this case, but we haven't necessarily heard them in other situations with regards to questions that we might have for police conduct. All right, so fair enough. Fair statement to make. Okay, concentrating on the news that, that came out, I have an issue with the Acting Commissioner of Police that I mentioned previously. When the investigation was ongoing, when there was no conclusive report or evidence, when nothing was produced, he defended his police officers. Mm -hmm. He made a statement, as, a, as you would say, for all intents and purposes, defending his police officers. And I made it clear that when he stated that, it was premature of him. Because whilst I understand that as the head of the table, you should be willing to defend your subordinates. In this day and age, you cannot handle that in that manner. You cannot take that risk. As not only from a public relations standpoint, but also from the position of a commissioner of police. And therefore, there are no repercussions for McDonald Jacob. Because technically, he didn't do anything wrong. However, I hope he understands and he learns that given his rule and given the current state of crime in Trinidad and Tobago, given the current state of confidence within the police service and national security within Trinidad and Tobago, it, was, it, it just adds to the hopeless, uh, hopelessness that, that the citizens are feeling. And I think it's quite unfortunate that he took that position very early on. And I think that he should apologize. I, I firmly believe that he should apologize because, you know, you could try and brush it off, but this acting commissioner of police cannot just continue to talk and talk and talk. Give him a chance, people are saying, and, and we're giving him a chance. Uh, even Mr. Gregory Abood points out yesterday, what's wrong with having an acting commissioner of police? And he made a valid point. But at the end of the day, how do you feel about it? Because I know when I got that, that, when I heard of that PCA report, and I know the PCA supposedly being an independent institution, I'm, I'm not going to question yeah, it yeah, this yeah. morning, right? I know instantly it came to my mind that McDonald Jacob is going to come out this morning and say, don't worry, the law will take its course, justice will be served. But at the same time, completely forgetting that he stood up and defended those officers. What is wrong with this man? And it has nothing to do with him, with his status as acting. So, so the, the, the failure in the moment or the lack thereof, however you, you view it, the fact that he's acting um, doesn't matter. If he was the substantive commissioner of police and he made those remarks, the consequences or the potential fallout will be the same. What are those? Well, first of all, and the irony of course is we have to say well, the officers involved are technically innocent until proven guilty. We should not encourage any sort of vigilantism, retaliation of any kind. And why do we say that? Because basically, that was the situation that the suspect was under when McDonald Jacobs took such a hard stance on his guilt and the officer's innocence and the officer's being he heroic in this situation. And you have to question now, was the stance of the commissioner and the service 
did that encourage what we saw that Friday? A very aggressive police service that thought, hey, somebody killed one of our own. We need to find this person and we need to use whatever means necessary. Short of, they did not kill anybody, but at least there was, there was a couple of incidents that, that were reported to the media. Mm -hmm. They are, I know someone personally who was concerned of, of just even being on the streets in the entire Digger Martin area because they, they got wind of what was going on, right? So what would have happened if another major incident came out of that? Those are the type of consequences that somebody in the role of commissioner of police needs to understand with their statements, especially when you want to make such strong statements and unfortunately, prematurely. Yes, you trust your officers so you don't contradict them, but you have to know the difference between not contradicting your subordinates and, you know, going too far and believing what they say and supporting them to that extent without enough evidence, without any sort of true um, checking of the, the incident, investigating into the matter. But then there's a whole other question that we have to ask. Why was he so quick to support his officers to this extent? The officers are involved in a shooting. I understand. You know, one of your own died. It's easy to, 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 to get on the defensive and believe that a suspect shot him. But on the flip side, it's almost as though the commissioner was completely unaware of the possibility that this could have gone the way that it went. So I'm wondering now if the acting commissioner is still smiling under his mask this morning. I'm wondering if, if, if he regrets making those comments or if he's in that position because he made those comments to the press at PC Hill's um, funeral. He made those comments to the press. And you're absolutely right. You need to understand the position or the difference in, in, in supporting and defending your subordinates, whilst at the same time upholding the principles and the yeah, rule you, of the organization. You can defend them, right? But you defend them the same way that you hold off. You say, well, the matter is being investigated. One of our own died. We are taking it very seriously. All involved are taking it seriously. The suspect, we will do everything to apprehend the suspect alive. He is technically innocent until proven guilty. Things like that, things that are a bit more neutral. However, the commissioner got caught up in the emotions of the moment, unfortunately. And that is when you could make mistakes, when you get caught up with emotion, and then you lose track of the rational pros and cons, because you have to be in control of the situation, because you are, the, the narrative is not guaranteed. Now, the other aspect of this that I'm also looking at, because I'm, I'm happy we've been given some sort of clarity to some degree on some level. Well, it's, still, the, it's still not finished. Exactly. It's not resolved. And that's why I said some sort of level, uh, clarity to some level. The other aspect I'm looking at, at, at this as well is that what has taken place with the police investigation? Where is the Minister of National Security with the ballistics report? A preliminary report was supposed to be pr produced to McDonald Jacob, I believe two or three weeks ago, somewhere around then. Where is that now? So the PCA, uh, when, you take, when you consider all factors and you consider the you know, previous investigations by the PCA, the PCA acted quickly in, in this instance. The PCA has produced a report and has advised the DPP. The DPP will take it from there. The thing now is, is the report by the TTPS being deliberately delayed before this PC report or ballistics report would have been produced to the public? I, I, I'm not making any allegations. I'm just asking questions because I find it very, very difficult to believe that it takes so long for a police investigation to take place, especially when it deals with one of their no, own. Well, so in this matter, I think this investigation is not just about the three officers involved in the incident, but with regards to the extent that a false narrative was given to the commissioner and who was involved, what was the intent of that involvement, to what extent could criminal charges be laid? Because again, it, it didn't just say that the three officers, it also said, um, let me get the correct, 
quote on the Newsday article, it implied superiors, Western, I think it was Western Division Task Force, senior Western Division officers. You wouldn't call all three of them were not, that, that were involved, that were there on the Hill. I don't believe all three of them would be senior Western Division officers. So to what extent is the police investigating the wider situation? And then, okay, I understand if it will delay reporting because you don't necessarily want to be premature because ironically, that's the mistake the commissioner did. He prematurely cast judgment on the situation and declared it in the affirmative to be one way when it was the other or when it is expected to be the other based on the physical evidence that is currently available. So if we are going to be fair to acting Commissioner of Police McDonald Jacob, his position is not necessarily one that's easy. But no position when it comes to public service is easy. Some will have it more difficult because of what it encompasses when compared to others. Some will have it easier. Nevertheless, no position or role is easy. But you were placed in that position due to your experience and seniority or whatever else people might think. At least that is what we've been told. With that, it is unfortunate that this morning that with one of your officers now deceased and his funeral has taken place and his family has had to say their goodbyes and you at his funeral says you're smiling under your mask this morning because there is hope. Unfortunately, you fed the nation nothing else but hopelessness. In fact, to, to continue that, you said that the TTPS, you want to show that the TTPS is doing all that they can and is assuring that they are tackling the situation. The Minister of National Security indicated a few months ago for the nation to have more patience. Please have more patience. Uh, this morning. While we're running out of patience. We're running out of time. Because people are stating that, oh, Trinidad is going to fall apart. Trinidad is going to fall off the cliff. We are already there. Well, unfortunately, we're already there. I, I don't know if we're there. I, 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 I firmly believe that we're already there. The and, that, and that is not a comment that is political in, by any nature. That is a comment by the state of things, the state of leadership, the state of governance. It goes for both sides. And the mere fact that all of us are crying and pleading for change, but we don't want change because we never act upon it when we have an opportunity. So, you know, I mean... In, in, in all instances, when you add the equation together, you really think that we're not there as yet? The thing is, for a nation, usually most people, you're not going to see it coming. You're going to see signs of the degradation. But at the end of the day, when it actually hits you, you'll, it'll still take you by surprise because you won't expect a nation to fall apart in such a manner. But nations have fallen apart in such a manner. That is how empires have fallen after reigning supreme for hundreds of years. It is nothing new to human civilization, to a small country like ourselves that had limited advantages that seem to be running out. We don't have the time to, you know, wait and see, do business as usual, hope for the best and, and say God is a trinity. At some point, you know, God will migrate. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to respond. <laughs> At some go. point, he will migrate. Hey, everybody else migrating for greener pastures. Just Le saying. Well, just saying. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your state of the nation. This is your state of affairs. On this program, we can do nothing more than report to you the facts of what we know. And apart from that, we can only have discussions and debates. But when it comes to change, and when it comes to fundamental change, it is truly up to everybody, the citizens and all those involved. Because at this point in time, name me one leader who could rely on. I'm asking you, who, who is one leader that we could rely on? We take a break, ladies and gentlemen. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviours that encompass the biological influences, social pressures and environmental factors that affect how you think 
act and feel. Sight. Thursdays at 11 a.m. Only on WESN. Content Capital. So, Simone, in these times, things are very difficult. Life has changed dramatically. Many people have experienced mental health issues for the first time. So, people who have just managed to keep anxiety at bay are experiencing a lot of anxiety now. I am talking with one of another one of the major pillars of the women's senior national team. Her name is Rhea Belgrave. She's actually centre defence. Rhea is now part, again, of the CONCACAF pre preparation for the World Cup 2023. What's up, Doc? Tuesdays and Thursdays, here on WESN, Content Capital. As I run through the day, there's one thing that I need to give me more smiles and motivation to lead, to make new memories and nutrition to grow. My kiss and rich brand, the best taste that I know. Fill your day with love, free to live with the best for you. All across the nation, to make your moments new. Fill your day with love. Fresh for you, every day, and delivered nationwide. Kiss and rich bread. Fill your day with love. Knowing how to tell authentic is as easy as one, two, three. Find it, match it, search it. Step one, find the style number on the tag. Step two, match the style number inside the jersey with the number on the tag. Step three, search it. A quick Google search of the style number will verify the jersey is authentic when the search results match the jersey being searched. Don't be fooled by counterfeit jerseys. Before you buy, remember to find it, match it, search it. Fan Zone, two locations nationwide, Center City Mall, Chaguanas, and Movie Town, Port of Spain. Nationwide delivery available. The best way to get are at thebesttoys.com. Shop for the best brands you love at the best prices. Like VTEC, LeapFrog, Fisher-Price, Play-Doh, Hot Wheels, Bobby, Coco Melon, LOL, Baby Alive, Crayola. Visit us in-store at Forces Flagship Mac Bean. Shop online now at thebesttoys.com. Order via call or WhatsApp at 32DBEST to order. And remember, we have the best toys at the best prices. There's a taste in the air everywhere Feel the vibe cause it's something to share Smooth, rich and creamy, you'll find it right here Mix your smile, relax a while, it's fun and good chair This is Uncle Pete's. Immaculate Prayer Group and Friends presents its prayer breakfast on August 31st in aid of Monsignor Christian Pereira. The prayer breakfast begins from 9 a.m. at the Cathedral of Immaculate Conception. Cost is only $200. Come support the Cup of Gratitude in aid of Monsignor Pereira, August 31st. Tickets are available at the Parish Office of the Cathedral of Immaculate Conception and the Parish of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. It may seem like the hardest thing to do right now, but we all need each other to wear a mask, wash our hands, watch our physical distance, 
and stay at home. We need you safe. Together we can make the difference. Together we can curb the spread of COVID-19. So let's be responsible in our actions. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. Welcome back to Talking Point here on WESN, the content capital. Now joining us in studio uh, for a conversation this morning, and, and let me just inform you one time uh, that he has agreed, and again, we're appreciative, to stay uh, for phone calls after the 9 o'clock news this morning. So he will be taking your questions. But alongside Mr. Sean Michael Small and myself is the political leader of the National Transformation Alliance, Mr. Gary Griffith. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the program. Good morning, gentlemen. Good, Good morning, morning, viewers. Well, welcome back. Thank you very much for joining us. So I want to start with the conversation with where Sean and I ended it before you joined us. And, and that was in relation to leadership, particularly in national security. Now, citizens are being affected by poor leadership all around. But specifically within national security, there is an acting commission of police. We see media ambassadors visiting media houses. We even have one that joins us here on the morning, um, Mr. Ashraf Ali. W with that though, still it seems as though, though there's a lot of communication, there seems to be something lacking. Is it a lack of leadership or is it that there is no leadership? Well, you know, the, 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 there's, there's no good and bad in, in leadership. Um, leadership is plain new. That, that, is the, that is the line I think from General Sims. Everyone has different style, they will have a different style. Um, the last comment you made before I came on, you asked that, do we have any leaders we can rely on? And it's so coincidental that you put me on immediately <laughs> after. And leadership, no seriously, no leadership, it, it involves a lot. Um, some persons will look at some of the draconian uh, leaders that we have seen worldwide and say they have been successful leaders. Is leadership based on the success and the results or is leadership based on the individual, how he treats those under, uh, under his, his or her command? So there's a whole, there's a diversity. What we have seen, however, is that there is a void in leadership in this country throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. One of the big problems we have that will cause lack of proper leadership is that we do not get the best minds available to lead. Because whether it is red or yellow, PNM or UNC, whoever wins yeah. and, and gets in government, 300,000 people alone would have the opportunity to assist in, in developing the country. 1.1 million are totally eliminated because they don't have the red or yellow party card. So you immediately take out your most critical resource, which is the human resource, because that person is not a PNM or a UNC, depending on whoever is in government. And that cannot be right. We're up for a country to develop. You must find the best persons available, regardless of political affiliation, and put those persons to run. Um, our state boards, for example, it's about $3 billion in corruption, mismanagement, incompetence that take place because the majority of persons selected and state boards do not have a clue pertaining to the field that, that, that because they don't have the capability, but because they were pulling the chair for the political leader during the campaign and they were walking around with them, they have to give them a play. That is not how you lead. That's not how you govern a country. So it, to, the first thing with leadership in a country is to make sure you get the best persons available. You can look at the situation with the commissioner of police, the appointment. Um, I, the commissioner of police, whoever applied could come first. He could be the person the country wants the most. I remember the last time you spoke and you said that did Gary Griffith really reduce crime? I reduced every single crime by, by over 35%. When I left, the murder rate was going at 320 per annum. Now it's 600 per annum. Um, it was the highest visibility, deterrence, rapid response. Public trust and confidence went from 14 to 55%. Um, the, the public and polls wanted me back. But regardless of all that, the leadership we had in this country is that the prime minister said, the voice of the people, voice of God, forget that. Forget crime statistics. Forget who is by to be the best. It's what I feel. That can't be good leadership. So all I'm stating is that I hope that one day leaders could understand it is not about me. It is not about how I feel. Do what is right. Do what is right for the country. And, I, and finally on that, as it pertains to, to national security, again, likewise, 
we go back to Patrick Manning saying that to be Minister of National Security, you need common sense and a level head. No, you need to have some type of capability. Look at the best ministers of national security this country has seen from looking at um, Brigadier Joe Theodore. That's when the murder rate was less than 100. There was a reason. He had policies, he had the, the capability, he had the leadership and the charisma to get people to believe in him. And that I think is the importance of leadership, to do what is right and to understand that those under your command, are, you're not there to, you're not there to serve, um, you're, you're there to serve those under your command as well. In, in terms of, uh, of going back to, as, as you mentioned, uh, when you were commissioner of police, um, your exit from, from the commissioner of police, that situation, that case, um, and also the police service commission and the prime minister, to what degree or what extent has that impacted or influenced what you are uh, uh, aiming for now, what you are striving for now with the National Transformation Alliance? Well, I mean, simply it is just to serve because I don't need a job, certainly. I, don't, I, I never wanted or asked to be Minister of National Security. I never volunteered to be Commissioner of Police. It was, this was something that was pushed on me by the vast majority of the country when they told me to apply. The only reason I reapplied is because the Prime Minister changed the law for me to act. Remember, the law is amended. So when he says all the talk about, oh, Gary, Gary, this and the other, in June last year, he got the AG and gave him a directive, change the law because we cannot lose Gary Griffith. So something happened between June and August that caused him to change his mind. And that is the reason. And, and again, because of the 89% the poll said they wanted me to return. So that was the reason. Um, if it is that you ask what it is, what, what happens now, I mean, I, I think it is unfortunate for what, that, that whole thing that, that took place. Um, but the only reason I did it was because I wanted to serve my country. So if it is that there are other ways that I can serve my country, I don't need power, I don't need to, to lead. All I want is to, to make this a better country. Um, I have what I need. Um, I have my health. I have a, fa a lovely family. And I, I, all I want is to, I know I have seen things that I can do to make this a better country. It is unfortunate that we have pettiness that will take place and reign supreme. I mean, even the prime minister and the com acting commissioner of police I, am, I was the previous commissioner of police. I can help, I can assist, but you will block me on your phones. That is so petty, that is so childish. And that is where, that is where we have reached to in our leadership. So I will continue to push in my, and as much as possible if the country wants me to continue to find a way to make this a better country. I think one of the key things, because we have acknowledged on the show at the very minimum, there was a perception, there is a perception that the police was moving smoother, was moving a bit more professionally, a bit more effectively. And yes, you could argue the statistics between this year, well, not this year, and this year and your last year, you know, they don't necessarily paint a very good picture with the current situation. I think one of the interesting things that we have to ask, because we were looking at the current process to get a new police commissioner. It's almost going to be a year now. We're, we're in July, so we're one month away for all intents and purposes. And we were asking the question last year, before your contract ended, why, why are we waiting until after the contract is over to, to figure out what we're gonna do? So now we've reached the point where we're, we're almost a year out with an acting commissioner, and as well as all the controversies, the, the, the weight, the fact that we have no candidate that's even a front runner that the, the, that the public could even say, hey, what about this guy? You know, it, it leads us to ask questions with regards to how we even develop the leaders in the police service. Now, we've been talking about it throughout the week. Um, Timothy Hammersmith was on the show Tuesday. He actually put forward the idea, what if we have, what if we change how leadership in each service is, 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 is developed officer training schools, and then now it, it, it brought him to the point of having commission or non commission officers like in the military. I mean, I don't know how practical it is because of the leadership structure and demands. You know, it's not like you're gonna have a 18 year old second lieutenant or lieutenant in charge of a police station. I don't think that will necessarily work. But the development of leadership in the service, because it's a niche role, you can't just put a business management graduate in, mm -hmm. that, in, in leadership in the police. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the, the good part, because I was in the military, I spent 17 years in the military and, and I did it. I mean, exactly that. I was a, just, just left as a teenager and then immediately I went to Sanus and I came back being in command of 30 men equivalent to a police station as a second lieutenant of a, with a platoon. And I just kept moving from there. 
and the police service would have the same thing. But because the defense force has what you'll call commission officers, and you can just shoot straight to the top, and then you just keep flying because of that leadership skill, in the police service, you'll have hundreds of good men and women who will apply, and they will remain as constables for about 10, 12 years. But they have such leadership skill, they get frustrated because of what they see above them mm -hmm. through persons who have been promoted based on seniority being the precedent. I pushed this heavily, and I was, I mean, got a lot of pushback because individuals love to just sit back, do very little, and expect to be promoted based on them spending so much time in the service. Now, if you have good, young, dynamic persons, they stay there, they get frustrated. What happens eventually? They leave. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then and so we lose the good quality. And I'm not saying with all, but I'm, I'm, you, see, you just spoke about Ashraf Ali. There, there are about 10 or 12 persons in middle management in the police service. If we put emphasis on them, which is what I was doing, that middle management, you get and put emphasis on them to train them, to get them to jettison straight up to the top and find an avenue. So, in, and, and, and I did it. I drafted it along the line. Like, listen, we have, if it is that we have, positions for about 15 um, ACPs or um, that we, we could look at ACPs and senior soups have about 20% of those that can be allowed to, to be promoted without having to go through the process of waiting until seniority because I must serve 25 years before I could become a senior super on ACP. If there are persons with that capability, shoot them to the, to the top and allow that, which is similar to the commission officers. And then you'll have the other ranks as well where they'll have persons who gradually continue to improve as it goes along. Mm -hmm. But just having, but we have lost so many good police officers because they get frustrated, they, they get a law degree and then they, they move out. I I think it's important. A lot of things what you said there. First, we know that the, the, the mandate to frustrate as one of our viewers likes to talk about with regards to resistance to those types of changes. We've seen that even with Gibbs. I think that's one of the main reasons that T more or less didn't last in the service. He can rarely effect any change. But with regards to having officers and understanding, yes, you're going to have some officers, they might be stable, they might be dependable, but are they really going to achieve what you need them to achieve to be promoted at high and high levels? And it's something that we should look to other jurisdictions to how they handle it, because it's not as clear cut. When you have to wait 20 years, it's not merit. And everybody complains about not promoting on merit in the country, but we don't actually do anything about it. But Mr. Griffith, in terms of achievements, uh, Acting Commissioner of Police, McDonald Jacob, would have worked alongside you when you were in that position. Um, and, and when you left the police service, uh, he, for more or less, he, he took over that role. Um, he was placed there as acting now. Um, Whatever you all would have done together, are you seeing that now uh, being carried out by Acting Com um, Commissioner Police McDonald Jacob, or how would you rate his performance with very short time that he's been there, and, and, and yeah. very openly and honestly? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm definitely not into the, the, the bashing. I mean, it, it serves a little purpose. I mean, the country, they have judged um, the Acting Commissioner of Police, they have judged me, and, they, and, they, and it's the right of the public to do so. So I'm not here to, to judge. Um, or, or to measure the performance of, of, the, of Mr. Jacob. What I can say is that when I was commissioner of police, he was a very good second in command because I would give him a to-do list every morning and he will adhere to it. You could be good in that, but then becoming a leader where you have to think out the box, you have to be proactive, you have to be dynamic, you have to be honest, you have to try to build the moral a trust and confidence of the public and the police service. That is something totally different. How it is that you operate from that to another is something, is, 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 is two it would be two different things. One of the things I think he needs to, to look at is that the first way to solve a problem is to admit that there is a problem. And uh, again, going back to my, my last eight months as commissioner of police, I tell you, we were going at about 25 odd murders per annum, which as I said, up until August last year, we were going at 320 per annum. The eight months since then, we are looking at closer to 600. For him to continue to say crime is not out of hand, and now he has used a new word that the media, our media, sometimes they, they, they get gullible. He, he says pre-pandemic crime, they, 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 he calls it. So he, he wants to leave out the period when Gary Griffith was there and look, measure crime statistics before me or before COVID and measure to see, well, see, things are not that bad. So he's trying to, to allude to the fact that it's because of COVID that there was a drastic reduction in crime. And I beg to differ, because if you look at LA, Boston, Detroit, New York, uh, every, almost every single major city, crime went up in North America. And there's a reason for that. Because it's only in a banana republic you will think that because of COVID, hmm, a man is not going to rape, kill, or murder. In fact, it is just the opposite. When you have a, a worldwide pandemic, it will cause inflation, 
um, increase in goods and services, unemployment. Um, it will cause persons now to lose their jobs. It will cause now persons to get more frustrated. It will cause in, um, even domestic violence situations because you're, you're, you're locked up. So the nonsense you hear from even from some criminologists, a criminologist for you to make that statement, you, you should have spoken to prisoners. Why are you not committing so much crime? And don't say it's because of COVID. Because we put policies, we put programs, it was about 100 policies every year in, in rapid response, a higher deterrent, a higher visibility, building public trust and confidence, finding ways for the public to, to, to give information to us. We did things called as, known as predictive policing. This thing that we love to speak about with the detection rate. I wasn't pushing that. I mean, that was important, but the predictive policing was pinpointing a situation that might take place through intelligence-driven policing to prevent the crime from taking place and to provide the deterrent of uh, GPS on police vehicles, a rapid response, operational command center, body cameras, dashboard cameras, undercover officers. What he has done, unfortunately, he has scrapped, shut down, dismantled every single thing that I implemented. And that is unfortunate. Um, that is what politicians do. PNM or UNC, they get in government, they shut down and scrap everything, and the country suffers. I would ask him, he needs to think of the bigger picture. He needs to expand and, and stop thinking about Gary Griffith. If something is working, you don't, you don't shut it down, you don't dismantle it. And then by trying to, you're trying to block me because I mean, and, I, and it is hope now that the country must not be seen, that the police service, sorry, is seen as being political. He made a comment recently, and it missed a lot. He referred to comments made by the opposition as being uh, alluded to them being retarded. And I mean, for, uh, uh, to, to make a comment like that as a commissioner of police, and that press conference, I didn't know who was the politician between him and Mr. Hines. So you must not in any way have the police service seen as being politicized. And all it takes is public trust and confidence. It is critical. As I said, it was 14%. It went to 55%. And it is not because of me. The officers out there, they were heavily motivated. There was a drive for them to perform. And you need to keep that. Without that, without that morale and motivation, without public trust, you're going to see the crime statistics heading head in the wrong direction. Uh, you also mentioned something, so I'm swinging the conversation a little bit now. You, you mentioned um, public trust and confidence is absolutely critical. Uh, but then and again, it's contradicted, as you mentioned, that public opinion does not seem to matter when it comes to leadership positions in trans or leadership rules. Uh, it, it seems to be thrown out the window. And, and interestingly enough, I think that is one of the aspects of a banana republic, in my opinion. You would have also alluded to that. So in, in terms of that, it's very difficult because public opinion only is really heard or voiced around the times of an election. Yes. And, and, and with that, not often do you see the same people who voiced opposition opinions uh, during whatever term may still fall into that trap of being a diehard, regardless of the party that they support. So in terms of the National Transformation Alliance, I mean, it's going to be very difficult to break that psyche of diehards. It's going to be very difficult to now attract young, fresh minds, new voters. And, and exactly what were you thinking in establishing the NT? And exactly how do you plan to go about breaking that psyche and, and, and you know, placing us out of that description of a banana republic? Well, uh, you, it, that is the reason why I've done this, exactly what you've just said. The country has been so divided, and it was deliberate. There are certain persons on either side of the political fence that deliberately cause the division. They know what they do. It is done deliberately to, to circle the wagons and to, and to ensure that your body of that race base can stay now to mobilize and support your party. And it is sad. So the comments that are made, when you hear politicians make these comments, it is not accidental. It is deliberate for circling the wagons to ensure that your base is solidified. Mm -hmm. So, and you'll get probably 150,000 on either side that will always be like that. And I mean, that is sad, but that is life. That is how they are. I mean, you can look at the same with Democrats and Republicans, mm -hmm. where some of them will do the worst, but you don't care. You're Democrat or you're Republican until you're dead. And, but the good thing is, is that this country, we are moving forward. If you look at going back to what is known as the third constituency, those persons who think out of the box and make decisions based on what is right for them, their family, and their country, they are not PNM or UNC till they're dead. It started in 1981 with the ONR with 91,000 votes. It moved in 1991 to the NAR with 127,000 votes. It then moved in 2007 to the Congress of the People with 147,000 votes. In the last 10 general elections, seven, they were in, all, in the seven out of the 10 where they had a third party, that party was the catalyst to decide the outcome of the general election. That's how powerful that third constituency is. That 150,000 that has now moved to 200,000 plus. And because of, because I have shown it, it continues to increase. 
if it is that they go down a straight road, they say they split the votes and the PNM will win. If they, uh, that, as we would have seen in 1991, 2000, even with 2000, 2001, sorry, with Ramesh Maraj party that caused the, um, PNM to win Tuna Puna, um, 2007. If it is that they, they solidify with another party, it becomes an annihilation for the PNM, such as 1986 and 2010. So it shows that, a, that that third constituency, that bridge constituency, which is where the NTA was formed, it's a transformation alliance, it's a transformation of minds, it's a, it's an, and it's to ensure alliance between different persons of, uh, with, with, with this similar type of mindset. They know, and we can and would become the catalyst to decide the, the governance of this country. Um, if it, this is really the point will be made now, or does that mean you're going to join with the UNC or you're going straight? That we, if it is that we formed a party and it was set to join with another party, well then we should have, we should have just gone there in the first place. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that, that those 200,000 independent voters and thinkers need a voice, they need an avenue. And that's, what we, that's the reason why we have assembled and established ourselves as a transformation alliance. Well, you're not the only party to look to be entering into national politics. We already saw, uh, you, you, could, you could maybe have your historic loss or defeat from the PNM in the THA election last December. The implications of that is not fully understood um, because there's a whole sorts of complications from the pandemic and pandemic recovery, which is impacting the situation. However, that party is now looking to come to Trinidad at the same time. So whereas before we would have had examples, really and truly, of a major third party, yes, there were others in the People's Partnership, but the, 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 the impact might not have potentially been the same that we could see in the unknowns that is now the NTA and, and the PDP entering into a general, if both parties end up participating at the same time. I do have to ask, I think before the third party, unfortunately, we have to go there with regards to racial division. Demographically speaking, you would always assume, well, they will split votes with the UNC. But now we're seeing at least one party, the PDP, we're wondering if demographically they'll split with the PNM. Mm -hmm. And in your case, because you yourself are of, I, I, like myself, I would say, of mixed race, no one is looking, no one knows what box to shoehorn <laughs> you in. Right, and to just assume, well, obviously he's of this race, so the party will be of this makeup, yep. and it will, and it will end up like that. Do you think that we now have an interesting position where we might see something historic and new come out, where it's not just going to be well the PNM and whoever splits votes with the other party, but now we might have four horses in this race. Yes, the results might show, okay, some are more popular than others, but the dynamics might be something we've never seen before. No, de definitely. I, I, you're correct, and that could very well happen. The perception that it is always going to be a two-horse race and a third party becomes a splinter, um, a, a spoiler, or somebody to help another. This can very well be something, because I think this is a time where you've seen the country so frustrated, and those persons who are PNM on UNC till they're dead, it, that is, that, those numbers are, are, are dwindling. It is going down. And again, going back to a Persons who have never even had the opportunity of an alternate choice, of a choice other, sorry, than the PNM or UNC. Those are persons between the age, with the age of between 18 and 33, because the last time you had a third choice would have been in 2007. So, and, and when you speak about young voters, I will say under 40, even under 45. And actually, the reason I say that is because those individuals are no longer. I am daddy and mommy is telling you, you live in this house, you're, this is a PNM or a UNC house. Young persons initially from 45 up, they will buy into that, that this, my daddy and mommy would do a PNM or UNC, so I have to go that way. Now it is changing. Young persons, because of technology, because of their ability to probably know more than older persons, because of the access of social media and so forth, they are advising their parents of what they are doing wrong by them have been so so tunnel vision to, to select parties based not, not on, uh, on what is right or wrong, but based on it being a virtual cult, a, a cult not even a cult here, is that, uh, and, and being obsessed by I mean, having to, no, you, if you want to stick with something, you stick with something based on a reason, like me, I stick with Manchester United and I'm suffering for it, but you stick with, you stick with your club, that, that is different, so you could stick with a club that probably by W Connection might be them, but, but you stick with it. I, I share your pain by the way. <laughs> yes. But you don't operate like that when it comes to your own lifestyle, your health, your well-being, your safety and security for you, your family, your assets. By having that holding on to this party, that is, that is you don't, how could you think? You have to think of what is right for you and your country. Well, here is the big question to me. For any 
other party, that isn't PNM or UNC, and even UNC is not that old, we, we, we tend to forget. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, because the COP, they stuck it out for the second election, but then after the, the partnership the collapsed, I guess you could say, with that interesting choice of a re-election campaign. <laughs> um, they eventually, now they are faded into obscurity, you could say. You're going to start a party. Usually the first election is not going to have great results, right? The PDP started off in the same way, but they were able to, to build actually abnormally quickly. We don't necessarily gonna have high expectations. Anything that, that comes from, 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 for your party, I would say would be gravy. Would you be willing to stick it out to two or three election terms? Because I think premature, Premature um, acquiescence is usually death knell to any new political party yeah, in the no, country. That, you're correct. But that third constituency would always be there. Whether you call it the ONR, the NAR, the COP, the NTA, it will always be there. There will always be that need, and that's what this country has. Um, you speak about race. And I mean, it was even told to me, they said, well, Gary, we don't think you could be a political leader or even a possible prime minister because you're not Afro in no Trinidadian. That was amazing. And when you look at just further up the island, you had Jamaica had Siaga and Manly. So we feel that you must be one or the other to, to actually, be, actually be embraced. And I think we are, we are diminishing the intellectual ability of citizens of this great country by believing that it, that can happen. And it should not. So definitely the NTA, what we are, it, is that it's to, it's to fill that, bridge that gap um, between, of persons who feel that I do not have to be a PNM or UNC till they're dead. And again, what we have also, what we know are known as supporters, because some people, you know, they, they, they don't want to be members, but they, are, they, they would be support, they, they are willing to support something. So you could still be a PNM, you know, you, and you, are, you have a PNM party card. But if you feel it has reached a time where, listen, they need to step down for a while because they have now lost their way. There's nothing wrong with you shifting. That doesn't make you a traitor. I hear these comments as well about people you call grasshoppers. You should be happy that you're a grasshopper. It means you have, you have an independent mind that you're not so caught up in, in one area, regardless of whether they're good or bad or indifferent. You see it and you see, we have people in the media like that, gentlemen. Regardless mm -hmm. of what, they will always find a way to find an excuse for what the PNM would have done wrong or the UNC. And that, you, you can't be right. You can't be an impartial person in the media. And you find that every single time you speak about the PNM, the NMO, the UNC, one, way, one is always right and one is always wrong. You need to be independent, especially in our media. But again, thinking out of the box, Fox is, uh, look at Fox. <laughs> so you, you, have, you will always have uh, media houses that, and persons that would be like that. I am looking at those at the bigger picture that we can, we do have many persons. It's, as I said, it was 147,000 in 2007. It's easy now over 200,000 to 250. Would that be enough for, for that third party to go all the way on, the, on their own? It, it, it remains to be seen. Well, Mr. Griffith, we have uh, two minutes left. Um, and I have uh, two parts of this question to ask you. The first one is, there are those who have expressed that the only reason that you're doing this is because you hold a grudge in relation to your exit. I, I don't know, how do you respond to those critics? And, and the final question is, you, you made a comment previously about what is best for Trinidad and Tobago, but have you sat down and thought, what is best for Guy Griffith? No. If I did, then I wouldn't be doing this because, as I said, I don't need a job. I don't need the pressure. Um, this affected my health. When I was working 18 hours a day, seven days, 18, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, to try to transform the police service to reduce crime and make people safe, taking every single call, it, it, did, it did nothing for me other than it put my, my family lives at, at, at risk. There were 33 death threats and eight assassination plans on, me, on my family and I. And that was what, so you gain nothing by it. Um, as it pertains to the first question, it, it is laughable because I can tell you, that, uh, grudge to who? So you are automatically stating that the NTA is a party that is designed just to hate the PNM. Some of the closest persons that I have seen in, um, that, I, that I associate myself with are PNM persons. And I could tell you, and I'm being bold to state it, that if and when the NTA is in government, there are individuals in the PNM that I see have been of value. Donna Cox continues to show her, her ability. This lady is extracting different things in the woodwork in her ministry of corruption that has never been seen before. And the more she does it, the more she's going to, people are going to be jealous of her. And uh, uh, likewise, uh, I look at Faris Alwari, I look at Rowan Sinan, and I have seen good people. So I am not here, the one thing you're not going to get in Gary Griffith is to hate every single thing that the PNM will do or vice versa. I, am, I speak exactly how I see it. And so as pertaining to having a grudge, 
it, it doesn't that that if that I wanted to have a grudge, I could have just joined the UNC, become a right hand to Kamala, because I was probably one of the most successful ministers in, in, the, that, in that government, and I would have let PNM have it. So they need to try again. My concept is what I am doing is very hard, is very difficult, uh, it is time consuming, and I am just doing it to try to make this a better country. Well, I, I would just like to thank you for not doing that, because we already have Anna Roberts and we don't need another one. <laughs> Anyway, folks, uh, you heard Sorry, from, I, I, I couldn't help myself. You, you heard from uh, Mr. Griffith there. You're a journalist, impartial. <laughs> you know? I, I, but, but anyway, we heard from I Mr. I don't agree Griffith with you about Forrest. Um, I don't agree with you about Forrest, but... Nah. So, we're going to break for news on the hour now, but when we return, the phone lines will be opened, and you can call in and uh, ask your questions to Mr. Griffith this morning. So stay tuned to the program. is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. Every day we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences and our aspirations. Storytelling is an art, an art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, multi-camera productions, live events, streaming and virtual conferencing, we are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. In this season, we talk more about health, wellness, and everything in between. I am so excited to share with you everything about health and wellness so that you can design the life that you've always dreamed of. Join me here on What's Up Doc. What's Up Doc, Tuesdays and Thursdays, here on WESN, Content Capital. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water woes, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fix It, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Burning questions, urgent topics. Welcome back to One on One the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens, where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviours that encompass the biological influences, social pressures and environmental factors that affect how you think, act and feel. Sight. Thursdays at 11am, 
only on WESN Content Capital. The Mary Immaculate Prayer Group and Friends presents its prayer breakfast on August 31st in aid of Monsignor Christian Pereira. The prayer breakfast begins from 9 a.m. at the Cathedral of Immaculate Conception. Cost is only $200. Come support the Cup of Gratitude in aid of Monsignor Pereira, August 31st. Tickets are available at the Parish Office of the Cathedral of Immaculate Conception and the Parish of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Welcome back to Talking Point here on WESN, the constant capital. So alongside uh, Mr. Sean Michael Small and myself is uh, the interim political leader of the National Transformation Alliance. That's Mr. Gary Griffith. He's with us in studio and he's agreed to take your questions this morning. So feel free to call in and uh, ask your questions uh, to Mr. Griffith. The numbers are on your screen um, and the phone lines are open now. I only ask you to be respectful in terms of the questions that you pose as well as uh, the timing so that we give others the opportunity and a chance. Also be respectful to other callers. Let's not now fight with dueling phone calls. Yes. Now, very quickly, whilst we're waiting, because the phone line's open, any thoughts or opinions on, on the recent, uh, well, not recent, as of yesterday, the PC report into the PC girl's murder? Yeah. Well, shooting, oh. shooting death. Shooting, shooting. Shooting death. And we have to actually be very, very careful how we use words. Um, so hold on that thought, because we do have a call on the sure. line with us. Good morning, caller. Mr. Paul and former Commissioner of Police, Mr. Griffith, I'm not addressing you as the leader of the NDTA this morning. First of all, Mr. Paul, your utterances about Anna Roberts was on call for. I, I think your, your, your color has shown that um, you have to be down the middle, no bias. I would just like to point out, that is my opinion on an individual. Who, right. I, do, okay. who really I do not appreciate the level of rhetoric and the lack of any reasonable arguments coming from him. Right? So Fair that's enough. not that's not my opinion on the party. All right, give the call an opportunity. And I have had individuals on EPN who I have called out, including the former AG whose job I call for and right. was eventually no, but, taken. But I'm saying you're a moderator, you're on a national program. No bias should be part of it. Mr. The Honorable Gary Griffith, I'm calling you honorable. There are two issues in the media at this point in time. One of them is the freeing of five individuals that was committed for a murder. My take on it, and I've seen it in the press, I am questioning the honesty of the newspaper reporting. And why I'm saying that? The judge whose competency was under attack was not identified. The appeal court judge's name was identified. And I wanted to know why the press was like that. The fact is that we have having a debate in parliament for judges in the CCJ. And we are, are, are breathing ground for potentials there. That is one. I want your take on that. The other one I want to take on, the contractor with the 27 guns. It was passing strange. He was only charged for transferring his gun, not the 27 firearm. And I'm wondering, and I'm thinking outside the box just as you, did he have many FUS to have that in possession? That is from a distance, the fact that he was charged away. And the other is... All right, all right caller, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you there because we have other callers yeah. and, and Mr. Oh, we need to get, respond. Yeah, we yeah. Need to so I, I'll try to run it in 20 seconds so we'll get more callers. All right, so the first thing as it pertains to the firearms, um, what I've, what I've um, been more to your attention, the majority of the firearms, first thing, he acquired it before my tour of duty. Right? So I think <laughs> just a few more, he got a couple whilst I was there. But that was one of the 14 policies I did. So what I did is I opened that Pandora's box that was never done before, and it backfired on me because people who were, especially certain police officers who were involved in serious 
questionable activities as it pertains to firearm misuse. You apply for a firearm, it will stay in a station for years, and then they will try to blackmail under true blackmail extortion. I put a stop to it by ensuring that police officers cannot um, hold persons to ransom. And who told me to do that? So they went, and then Stanley John found these, these are the jokers Stanley John found. So his report was false, misleading, mischievous. Remember this joker said, and I will call Stanley John a joker, judge or no judge, ex-judge, because he said it was a massive, well-oiled criminal industry. Almost two years later, two persons have been arrested. I, have, I arrested more persons for, um, for fraud and involving firearm um, abuse um, and, and blackmailing than, than this whole thing. So. What I did is I put 14 policies in place to try to minimize this type of corruption by putting the FUL card with a chip. Mr. Jacob has shut down every one of these 14 policies that I put in place again. So, and it was, it, one of the main concerns was that if persons, so that you, will, you will have three firearms, you will send it to the commissioner for another application and I would know you had three because I'm seeing a request now for a firearm. So the, the, uh, those are the things I put a stop to. Every time that somebody is coming with, a, with an application, I want to know how many they had because sometimes the commissioner would not know. He'll get 200 files a week. If it is, you have to spend 10 minutes to go through the file for each one. That's two, that's, you're looking at 2,000 minutes uh, a week that you have to go in, divided by 60. You're speaking about from eight to four, Monday to Friday, a commissioner will have to sift through every file. That couldn't work. Mm. So I found systems to make sure that if somebody is applying, just put on top, let me know how many the person previously had. So a, a, an officer can slip one through that the commissioner will sign without knowing. So that was one aspect. The other thing he spoke about as it pertained to uh, matters that are under investigation and before the courts, I would not speak about it. It is inappropriate. What I can state, however, and it will kick into your question with that matter with the PC, what we discovered is that there were certain um, elements within the police service based on intelligence that were aiding and abetting and involved in serious criminal activity in this country. Massive. I stepped on those toes. Those were the same individuals whispered to, to politicians and told them if Gary comes back, we're going to shut down the country and they panicked, which is what caused the, the turnaround with, um, with, with my reappointment. Mm -hmm. um, so when I discovered a very small number, but these numbers, they were covering um, for criminal elements, they were protecting drug blocks, they were escorting criminal elements. And I, when I realized that, I shifted them away from divisions, moved them away from one division into another, got rid of them. And, and through GPS tracking on the police vehicles, if they use the vehicle in that division and they moved across, we could know why is that a vehicle in the southwest going mm. to the western. All of these things have been shut down. And unfortunately now, um, some of these officers have been reassigned, returned to their unit. This matter with that happened in Diego Martin, that western division, there were certain officers. In fact, if you remember my quick point, last point, there were certain police officers who deliberately tried to frame me to claim that I, I had I pointed a gun. And they were linking with members of the media. They didn't know that that individual was my informant. And he exposed the fact that these officers wanted me out because I was affecting their drug turf and their drug blocks and their affiliation with criminal elements. That is how dangerous this thing is. It is dangerous business, a serious business. And instead of Mr. Jacob working with me for me to, to support him and advise him, he sees me as the enemy. Hmm. No, it's, we never got told exactly what the issue was. It's mostly been implied. Implied. I, I will respond to the caller's point about your biases. I will respond to that very shortly. But we have a caller on the line with us from Dabody. Good morning, caller. I'm very pleasant. Good morning. Good morning. You all, um, I know that you all are familiar with my voice by now. Yes. And I'm calling from Dabody. Yes. I have one statement and three questions for the, um, Mr. Griffith. My first statement is that it's a wonderful topic this morning. However, I strongly believe that Mr. Griffith being on your program this morning would definitely skew the discussion, as in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Based on his previous incarnation as the acting commissioner of police. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to Mr. Griffith, can I pose the three questions? Mr. Griffith, are you in agreement with the statement the, from the PCA with respect to the um, the jilks, the jilks shooting. Okay, let me let me answer and one after the, the other. Um, uh, no, no, uh, let me just let me just ask you three questions. Okay, okay, quick, okay. Now. okay. You spoke about leadership, Mr. Griffith. Do you think that you are a true leader? When I, a member of the 79ers, the police batch that Mr. Williams belonged to, I came to your office personally two consecutive years when we are having our reunion. I bought two trophies to commend you when I thought you were doing a good job. 
and you bluntly refuse to even come to collect it or send somebody to collect it. I came on sixth floor and delivered that invitation twice in two consecutive years. And because, Mr. Williams, your predecessor is a member of my party, you bluntly refuse okay, to well, uh, come uh, Sorry, but sir, you're, sir, you're blatant. No, no, you're being, you're being out of place to allude to the fact that that happened. Because, because of your love for Stephen Williams, you should marry him. No, 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 You are trying to allude. You are trying to allude. Yo, yo. No, sir, you're out of place. Listen. Listen. Caller, listen. Caller, listen to me, please. I have to raise my voice because I need to try and control this. You've asked the well, first I, question. I You've asked this, right? Me to okay, great. But I think he got your second question. He got your first question. What's your third question? Because we do have other callers, and I'm giving you the opportunity to I, ask your I, third I question. I appreciate that. I have never been disrespectful on your program before. Right. So go ahead. Ask your third question, because we have other callers waiting. What's your third question? My third question is, does Mr. Griffith have, believe that he has a chance in... Um, not losing his deposit in any of the elections, and will he be contesting in the local government election? Thank you. Thank you very right. much, okay, so, All right, so to, to clarify, I have never heard something so ridiculous in my life. Yeah. Because to try to allude to the fact that I didn't attend something because I had a problem with Stephen Williams. Sir, if you love Stephen Williams, you can marry him, but I think he's married already. So I'm really sorry, so you might have to go in the background. So to allude to that, I had conversations with Stephen Williams, unlike Mr. Jacob, who has blocked me and showed pettiness. I don't. So to allude that I, I know many of those persons in the 79ers. I met with them, I socialized with them at the Sports and Family Day. So what he's saying and nothing is the same thing. I have, no inv I have no knowledge at all of that invitation ever being given to me because every single correspondence that is given to me, I sign it, I reply, I endorse it, and I attend if I can. I, so I'm, I'm sorry, but I, cannot re I did not receive any such correspondence. If I did, I would have at least sent regrets. So if it is whether I was out of the country or whatever. So to come and try to link that because I didn't attend, because it was Stephen Williams, it shows how small-minded you are, sir, to feel that I will fit in your category with that type of mindset. Uh, as it pertains to um, what it is that every single comment you have made has shown that you're, you're, you're anti guerrilla and is your right. So to ask that I'm skewing this and if I'm going to lose my deposit, what it is that the NT intends to do is obviously going to be in total contrast to, to your view. So you, you seem to be a PNM till you're dead or, or UNC. That is your business. The NTA, we have our job to do, sir, and we will move forward with it. Well, we have a caller on the line with us um, from Claxton Bay. Good morning, caller. Hello, good morning. Yeah, hello, good morning, Sean. Morning, Keaton. Morning, morning. Mr. Morning, morning, Mr. Mr. Fisherman. Yeah, my take is on the copper wire piece. Copper wire I As on the news, there about 260 guys who sold in copper wire. Uh -huh. But do, if they ever do any investigation to the buyers, like who buy, get collected the copper wire and test the ship it? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, because I can tell you, if I have a certain guy by me, at least he just sell about, he just sell about Two ton of copper wire for the week, you know. Uh-huh. I'm telling you I know, you know. Yeah. No, no. So that's no. my idea, copper wire. I know, I know you've expressed that to us before. Thank you, Mr. Fisherman. We have a... Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, keep well. We have a caller on the line with us um, from Marval. Good morning, caller. Please, please turn on the volume on your television, caller. You're live. We, we can hear you. Hello. Good morning. Hi, good morning, good morning, fellas. Good morning. morning. Mr. Griffiths. Hi, good morning, sir. Hope everything's going good with you. Couldn't be better. That noise in the background is somebody selling scrap iron. <laughs> um, all I call to say, fellas, control your show. Please control your show. Don't let people get into nonsense and expand on one point for five minutes. Control your show. It's a great show. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, brother. You, <laughs> you know, you know and, and again, it goes back to that last caller. We're here trying to win national issues. You have a tabanka because I didn't come to your, to your event. Uh, I mean... So I would like to respond to the skewing the discussion. I think what people fail to understand is guests will always skew the discussion, right? We're not of the habit. And I have already been accused of an anti-PNM bias because I was too soft with Senator Lachmidial, uh, anti-UNC bias because of however I, you know, we handle the few PNM guests because the government does not like to come on media and, and face the public uncontrolled. So, Unless it's, of course, state media. Right. So guests will always skew because we're trying to work with the guests to get their perspective. 
right? If we disagree with their perspective, depending, we will disagree when they're not here, or if it's something that we cannot wait and we have to challenge them immediately, we will disagree with them immediately. We, we, we have a caller on the line with us. Uh, good morning, caller. Hello, good morning. Hi, guys, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I would like to congratulate Mr. Griffiths on the formation of the NTA. And I also wish to say thank you for making a difference in my area while you were commissioner because I used to be terrified, honestly, when my son would be coming home at night and I would hear gunshots in my area, left, right, and center. Um, when I called the police for anything, they actually arrived speedily because guess what? They had vehicles, okay? A little minor thing like cars. Um, also, I've never, ever, ever seen Keith Rowley in my area, and therefore I now hope to see Mr. Griffiths. My neighbors are also happy that they can actually have someone to vote for for the first time in several years. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you, Carla. We were speaking about public opinion earlier, and it seems as though, even though that you have now moved on to another aspect they, they, they're really focusing a lot on your tenure as commissioner of police well yeah, I mean, and, and it, it happens i mean in, in the united states i think 43 odd u.s presidents 31 had military service and there's and, and there's a reason for that we've never seen that we've never we've ne never seen a prime minister or president with any type of law enforcement or military service before i'm not saying it is a it is a qualification and, and is an entitlement but sometimes in the military it gives you some degree of leadership not just knowing how to lead but knowing how to serve and it plays a very big part towards the development of a country that's, a, that's actually a very good point uh, that's a yeah good point. fair point we have a call on the line with us uh good morning caller from digger martin good morning gentlemen good morning, morning sir and uh, mr griffith good morning sir um, I just want to say I thought you did a, a good job that while you were there in the, as the police commissioner. And um, I, I hope that you continue on the track you are going, and um, we definitely need a third party in this country. And the fact remains that um, you know, there was a lot of different uh, crime that came down under your watch. And unlike other people who are saying differently, well, they have the opinion just like mine. And um, I wish you all the best, and I hope that. Um, I have an extended family, and we belong to no party. We don't vote on party lines at all. But in spite of the number, and I assure you, we more or less vote on one. Everybody comes to one consensus when you vote. I leave you with that, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank caller. Uh, we have a caller on the line with us from California. I wonder if this is California in Coover, California, in North America. <laughs> is yeah. that caller still with us? Did we, we lose that caller? Off. All right. Yes, came up. Hi, good, hi, okay. hi, good morning. morning. Good morning, caller. I have something to tell me, Captain Griffith. Go on. Could you remember that a long time ago that Jim Rodriguez was a gadgeted officer of the cadet and was appointed assistant to the of police on his first appointment under Mr. Belfort? I would like you to remember that, and I see no reason why it cannot be happening again. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. If, if I could, I'm going back to the, to the caller just before, when she was speaking about the high visibility, uh, it, it had to do with the GPS tracking on police vehicles. We started putting the GPS monitor, measuring their performance, seeing how fast they respond to a distress call, linked in 999 with an operational command center we set up, seeing how fast they will get it, and that would all, that also stop police vehicles abusing their authority by, so if we see a vehicle going 80 miles per hour in Rice and, on Rice Road at 4 p.m. on a weekday, we know that you're, you're going over the speed limit, but we didn't send you a distress call, you just want to break the be the traffic. Mm. So we, that is where it started minimizing police um, overtaking, abusing their authority, making sure that they get to the response on time, minimizing that. that and because of that, criminal elements realize if they break into a house, if it is that they call 999, there can be a five minute response. The last thing I quickly is that again, when we formed the I support our service through Nicole Dyer Griffith, this was to, it is done worldwide, getting the communities to try to assist the police because the state can't provide. So they will repair vehicles, see about the air condition. Dennis Wren and the Express wrote 83 consecutive articles attacking that 
And it made you wonder who is who's on which on which side you're on. We had business sector repairing a vehicle in Shogonas in Cedrus, whatever, to help the police to get vehicles out on the ground. And Dennis Ren had a problem with that. And these businessmen never asked for anything other than just they wanted it to help the police to because sometimes they have no air, the air condition is not working. They have no paper for the printer. They, they, were, they were trying to get um, vehicles repaired. And Dennis Ren and the Express had up 83 consecutive articles. Now you notice even Kirk Witt fixing TNT, they wrote every week attack doing an article saying that Gary Griffith must be removed. Since I left office, fixing TNT, TNT has been fixed because there's not been one comment made by Kirk Witt. So Kirk Witt's way of fixing TNT was to remove me. And it shows sometimes when you have that type of agenda, you really wonder who you're working for. We have a, a caller on the line with us uh, from Shagones. Good morning, caller. Hi, good morning. Good, uh, I'm good morning. I'm the host and the panel, Mr. Griffith. Good morning. Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. All right. So I have a question that I want Mr. Griffith to address. Very early in his interview, he would have stated that according to whichever government ketchup or mustard is sitting of the day, automatically that disenfranchises 150,000 or so, you know, persons. Now, let me give my disclaimer. I am no fan of the Prime Minister and the Eastern government. However, isn't it ironic that a Prime Minister of a PNM sitting government would select a commissioner of police that ideally, Mr. Griffith, you were seen and known as a former UNC um, member, minister, etc. So it contradicts what you would have said early in your interview this morning. Could you address that, please? Sure, 100 percent incorrect. I'm 100 percent incorrect. And I will show you why. Had I been a certain member of the UNC and on good terms with the UNC, and I was, I was, I, I left on good terms. Could it be that the perception of the Prime Minister was that Gary Griffith was removed from office because he refused to, to lie and speak the truth? And because he was fired, he will have an axe to grind. So if he comes as the Commissioner of Police, I will direct him to do whatever I want because I know he'll want to get back at them. So when it is you go down that road, you could always look at it from the other the, perspective, the, the, sir. There's also the thought, because I've heard this, this is not my idea, but the fact that it was a political move to appoint exactly, Mr. Yeah. Griffith because as a former UNC member, the UNC would be less inclined to go after him in the same way. It, 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 it obscures the waters and it makes the situation a bit more complex because it's obviously not a PNM appointee of a PNM diehard. Um, of course, we kind of saw where potentially it, it worked until it didn't because then when they wanted to remove Mr. Griffith, the opposition was, was very much ready and willing to, to jump onto that case, which, okay, that is their right. They are the opposition. That is what well, they're supposed listen, to listen, sorry to cut you, but due to time, we, we have one more caller on the line with us. We're going to take the call, and, and that'll be it for this morning. Good morning, caller. Hi, morning, guys. Good How morning. Mr. Griffith, good morning. Good morning. Um, hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah live, live, go ahead. Yeah, morning. Um, I just, uh, it's wonderful to see Mr. Griffith on, on, on the screen this morning and listening. I want to um, say to him this morning, I have, I have two questions. One, um, I know Mr. Philip Alexander is a good friend. I know that. And uh, I don't know why it is that, um, if there's a reason why you haven't joined with Philip um, in terms of a, a coalition, one. And two, um, the, the country and state where uh, when you were there, we were feeling a sense of security. This morning, we don't feel that sense of security anymore across the country. And um, I think winning the election on, the sec on a security-based argument is, good, is a good premise to build on. However, when the politics gets messed up with the policing, I think that's, that's where we have our problem. So uh, what, what, you, what may be, and I know you are not a lawmaker, but, but what are some of the things you think that needs to change in terms of policing being effective without the interference of politics? Good, good morning, sure. you guys. Have a good, great weekend. Thank you very much, Paul. How much time do I have to be? Go on, make okay, your right. response. We'll okay, go right. a little okay, bit. So, so quickly, I, I have um, Philip Alexander, Watson Duke, um, Rural Munilal, Kamla Prasad Bissessa, Faris Alwari. Um, I have many persons who I deem as my friends on all sides. And therein lies the problem. We turn political affiliation into hatred and bitterness and war. I am not into that. And the NTA, we are not into that. We are not going to, we have not formed a political party. Are you, are you here, Wade Mark? The PNM is the enemy. The, you know, politicians, you have never held a gun. 
You don't know what it's like when I was in, in, in um, United Kingdom and the IRA. Every time I come out of a pub, I have to look under my car because they, because they, were, they were trying to kill British soldiers when I was linked to the British Army at the time. They don't know what it was when I spent six months in Haiti and watching children suffering because of war and famine. They don't know what it's like as a young officer in the attempted coup. I have seen what it is like to be in a war zone. That is what the enemy is, criminal elements, terrorists, uh, assassins. You're not going to look at a politician and because he has his own view and are different to yours and that person is deemed the enemy. We are not going down that road. Difference of opinion doesn't make you an enemy and that is what has destroyed this country. We have cut a line in the sand because of race, because of religion, because of political affiliation. The reason why we have formed that, that word alliance in the National Transformation Alliance is just for that, to try to bring people together. We may have difference in opinion. So, and I, so if Gary Griffith, why would I not join it? If I will join with Philip or Kamala or Rowley, well then why? But I could have done that, as I said, and that is not the intention. We see that there's a void of over 200,000 people that want a voice, and that's why it is we have formed this. Um, the quick point as it pertains to put policing, yes, um, national security is going to be a front burden issue. Um, I can confirm that I can deliver. I have done it. I have shown it that I can deliver. I would deliver. I can serve, and I would serve again. Um, but, I would, but it is much more than just national security. The NTA is going to get the best minds available, regardless of your political affiliation, to assist in, the gov in governing this country. Education, health, economy, social development, sport. Sport is actually going to be a major ministry that governments have never done because they've seen it as extracurricular. So we are going to, in the transformation, it is not going to be, you must have an NTA party card. You could be PNM or UNC till you're dead. If we feel that you have the capability to assist us in governing the country, we would do so. Well, very much so. Uh, Mr. Griffith, I want to thank you very much for the time we have for this morning. Thank you for your, your presence and your voice and uh, for sharing us your opinions. And we welcome you to the program again in the future. Uh, and, uh, you know, very quickly uh, to the first caller from Shimon, it's very, very quickly. Um, you're, you're right. In our position, we should show no bias and hold no bias. However, it was unfortunate that you would call in and, you know, chastise my co simply because if it is that you're pointing out a bias, uh, only in relation to one particular side. I mean, you never pointed out it uh, when he spoke about Farah Sarawi or any other government minister, and you have to bear that in mind as well. So sometimes before chastising others about their bias, maybe you should look at no. your bias first. You no, to just, be fair, just bear it, that in it mind. It was a tongue and cheek remark that might have gone too far, but it's not as though I personally make it a point of emphasis. That said, the individual that I mentioned is not someone of policy that, yeah. I, I, that, that I would respect. And there are people in the PNM who, who fail, not necessarily the same way, but who fail just as hard. And we've called them out on the show before. Anyway, Sean Michael Spall, that's it. Ladies yes, and gentlemen, we're over that's time. it. Thank you very much. The Master Control Stands, we're over time. Uh, but for now, have a great weekend. Remember, today's a good day. To have a good day. Bye bye.